Um, yeah, thanks very much for having me. I hope that it will prove to be worthwhile. I should say that um, I, I'm at several disadvantages, and probably the biggest is that I just got off the plane last night, and I'm sort of expecting that this may be the first talk I've ever given where I fall asleep before my audience. Um, the other one is I'm most self-conscious because I don't have my professorial jacket on. I, I went and visited my friend Mike, and we took a walk around town, and by the time I, we got out here, I didn't have a chance to go back and sort of get all you know, appropriately attired. So you're seeing me as I normally am. As Mike said, he didn't know I could have ever dressed ever did any differently than a slob, but there you go. Anyway, so what I want to do is, despite that, is try to talk to these slides for as, for as best I can. And what I thought I'd do with the talk today is try to give you a sense of, actually it's an overview, it's an overview of the kind of work that I've been doing over the last 15, 15 years or more, and try to talk about um, not just the work, but my approach to doing design and understanding design as a way of doing research. Uh, and in the midst, hopefully, I'll show you enough entertaining stuff that it won't be too boring. So I want to go um, back quite a while. As Leanne mentioned, I started off, well, I started off getting a PhD in psychology and then moved into kind of traditional HCI at a Xerox lab. And in those days, I was doing stuff, well, like traditional HCI, and, and at some point, I, I, for reasons I need not go into, I moved to the Royal College of Art in um, London and started working in a design context, which when I moved there, I really didn't know what that involved. And there were a few things that opened my eyes that I, there were a few sort of pivotal moments that opened my eyes and really set the course of the practice that I pursued today, and I thought I'd show you a couple of them. So the first, as Leanne mentioned this, is a project that was done by an MA student in our course named Rob Strong. Which, um, which I then went on and had, I was sort of his tutor on the project, but we went on and published a paper about it. And there were, it was a, um, actually a series of three pieces that I'll just focus on my favorite called The Feather. Uh, the Feather is a, a proposal or a model of a device um, for people, for intimate couples who are separated by distance. So the, it, according to the scenario, I might brought, have brought um, part of the system with me when I came here to Australia, in particular, down on the lower left is a photo frame that might show a you know, romantic picture of me and my wife. And the idea is that when I pick up the frame to gaze lovingly at the picture, it sends a signal back to London, and a fan comes on on the installation on the right and blows around a feather inside this clear plexiglass um, cone. Which is not, it's not a great image, but it's the best I got. And so the idea is that, again, when I, so just by this sort of natural act of looking at the photo, I send a signal to my wife in, in um, London that I'm thinking about her and a little emotional bond is formed. Um, it's a really sweet piece, I think. And it also was, um, at the time, totally novel to me. I had never seen anybody um, do something quite like that. And it also was uh, readable or legible from my background in HCI where I've been working on um, computer-supported cooperative work where people were, of course, very concerned about how you maintain ties between distant people, that the kind of ties that they were trying to maintain were more workmanlike and more um, about knowing when you could talk to colleagues and all. So this all of a sudden brought an emotional side to that kind of work that I, that I thought was really refreshing. Um, and in fact, you know, we published in the CSTW and all that. And arguably, so I believe that is probably the first example of a, of a device used to um, promote emotional intimacy amongst uh, separated couples, which since has become an incredibly recurrent trope in the, that kind of world. Um, the other thing that really opened my eyes was talking to Tony Dunn about a project he had done at the time called The Pillow. Um, and this was, I won't go into the history, but this is, a, this is shown here. It was a sort of mysterious piece to me, and he, started, he described it to me. And the way he described it was, first of all, it was the, the work had been done with um, sponsorship by a, a, I believe, Korean display manufacturer who had given us a bunch of um, slightly broken LCD displays and asked us what we could do with them. And what he did was embedded in this kind of semi-opaque brick, of uh, red brick, and, used, and then um, used the display to show patterns of light that then permeated the brick. And the whole thing was mounted in a transparent plastic pillow. Um, and the, the first thing he pointed out is that he was treating the screen to really change the aesthetic. So most LCD screens are all about high resolution and sharp lines and all that. And he was blurring it and making it a much more impressionistic display. 
And then he explained to me that the images that it was showing um, and the sounds that it played were made by capturing um, traces of electromagnetic communication that were floating around in the atmosphere. So everything from radio shows to, uh, to taxi radios to police communications and so forth, and translated into these patterns so that it became an odd form of ambient awareness display or sort of a, a radio that didn't, again, wasn't about sharp, crisp communication, but more impressionistic glimpses into the information that surrounds us. And that kind of, you know, was pretty intriguing. And then he explained to me that actually that it was a proposition that for a device that in a way turned the people who used it into voyeurs. So the notion was that by using the device to listen to this electromagnetic communication, it was very seductive, but then it put you in the position of being an eavesdropper, in a kind of morally questionable position. So part of what was going on in the design was, was playing with this notion of putting people into these positions and the way design could do that. And that was really eye-opening to me, and I think that was a real turning point because I realized, I realized that design could operate in ways that I had never imagined. It didn't always have to be uh, utilitarian, it didn't have to be serving a purpose in the way we usually imagine, and that it didn't have to be good or right, it could be um, serving strange narratives. So I'll just, these are some of my sort of takeaways from that, those few points. Is that I, I kind of think I learned around that period of time that design can talk about anything in a way I hadn't known before, that you, could, you can address almost all issues of what it means to be human through design, that the point of view you can take can be multiple and, and fictional and, and questionable, and that the, the kinds of way, things, the messages we give with design, the topics we address and so forth, can be extremely multi-layered and, and even incommensurable. Um, and I'll, I'll show you one of the ways that carried through from an early project called Alternatives, which is, I think, from around, actually, it says here, around the turn of the century. Um, so this is a project where I was working with my colleague Heather Martin, and we had sponsorship from Hewlett Packard to look at the notion of information appliances, um, which was in vogue at the time. Uh, and this is the notion of simple computational devices that would do one thing really well, uh, historically bit of a sidetrack. And, um, and so Heather and I started looking into the kinds of proposals for information appliances that were around, and most of them seemed incredibly boring to us. So there were things like little gardening appliances or, or ways to communicate in the home about tasks that needed to be done and so forth. And we decided to try to scope out a larger range of possible information appliances. And we captured this in the end in a, in a workbook. Well, I think the first one, no, the second one I ever did. Um, with very short proposals and, and um, descriptions about what these things might be. So I'll just show you, you this is an old favorite, it's um, called the Dawn Chorus, and it was for an artificially intelligent bird feeder that would train birds to sing songs of your choice. So that when the birds landed on the feeder, it could use some sort of tweet recognition algorithm to, it would probably play them the model of the song and then use a tweet recognition algorithm to um, understand how closely they copied and record and reward them according to how well they had done. And over time, of course, you train the birds to sing a song of your choice. And if you really were um, good, you could recognize different birds and treat them, train them in different harmony patterns and so forth and create a kind of dawn chorus that would sing the top 40 music of your choice. So that's one. Um, the other was a, another is the detour guide, which is an audio only guide that would use GPS to figure out where you were, but instead of showing your position on a map, it would lead you around where you wanted to go using um, audio signals so that, in a sense, you wouldn't, you know, it would allow you to, the city to be unexpected to you. You wouldn't have an overview of where you were going. You would discover as you, as you went along, but even better, you could program it to get you lost for a time so you could say, I'm going to get lost for an hour, and it would just take you on a meandering journey through the city, and at the end of the hour, you'd still be safely home. Um, or you might follow in the footprints of uh, people that you know were interesting, like UFO spotters or um, religious fanatics or whatever, and it would allow you to sort of borrow their lives. Uh, this is a proposal for a dream communicator, which would you would um, use uh, would measure your. Um, rapid eye movements to tell when you're dreaming and then signal, in this case this is originally an emotional communication um, proposal, it would signal your partner so I could be here in Australia, quite a time difference from London, and when my wife went to sleep and started dreaming I could start speaking to her or playing her sounds in her dream to try to um, uh, kind of um, 
affect the contents of her dreams, so I might try to lead her on a romantic boat ride on the river or something like that, and, and in that way be kind of emotionally close to her despite the separation. Um, this is the prayer device, it's sort of a telephone booth to God, it was designed to be found in public spaces and you could, uh, in moments of need, you could speak into it and what you said would just simply be transmitted overhead using a powerful electromagnetic signal towards the center of the universe where it might be heard by God or by passing spacecraft or maybe by nobody but might give you some feeling of solace that such a thing was available. Which, and, I, and so there were a number of these proposals. There were, this is still just a few of them. There were a number of proposals. They all sort of scoped out different ways that these designs might go. And I'm just kind of putting them on the table. I'm not going to say much more about them. We showed them to Hewlett Packard. The reaction was kind of like, uh, actually, they were, well, there was very, one guy said, what are you on? Um, but it actually, it, it was quite useful within the project. And we went on and sort of bought, uh, we tried to build a couple, well, we did build one or two of them. But mostly they exist just as proposals. And they've, um, they've, I, they're still quite meaningful to me. They really scoped out a way of thinking about what design can do that's um, really got you made sense. So let me go back. But I don't just do design. Um, I do design as research. And it's taken me a while to understand what that means as well. So uh, I'll show you another few sort of early examples of projects to give you an idea of where I come from on that. So um, soon after my conversation around the pillow with Tony, we decided to work together on a project and, and worked on an EU-funded project called Presence, where we were designing uh, um, computational stuff to help older people be connected with their communities. Um, and we ended up working in three sites, but, but we actually built equipment for a place called the Belmermeer in the Netherlands, which is a housing, kind of housing estate project that has a very bad reputation within the country for, um, it had, there's a lot of immigrant po community there that it's not uh, very high income and it's got a bad reputation for things like crime and drug abuse and so forth. But talking with the people who live there, we discovered that actually they really like the area and they're proud of it and they wanted the world to know. So we built a, we built a system that was meant to sort of help them do that in a way. Um, and the system had two parts. It was not fully realized that it had two parts that we did realize. One was these benches called slogan benches um, that you can't really see it in that, that image, unfortunately. But uh, they have um, a, a scroll mounted into the back of the bench, a kind of uh, endless fabric scroll like is used for bus destination blinds that we asked the older people in the area, because it was a project around older people, to write slogans about the area, what they believed on. on. And um, there were buttons that allowed you to page through the slogans and also an aerial fed into a system that was meant to automatically choose um, images and slogans, but we need to go into that. And the slogans were quite interesting, so there were things that people, the older people had written to us, like, I used to be restless because of negative thoughts and stuff like that. Um, and the other part was this image bank below, which was a kind of uh, stretched television set that showed images of the area that people in the Belmar had given us, and it was really meant to be on the outskirts and skirts of the Belmar, but we couldn't arrange for that. Anyway, we built these things and we, we deployed them within the Belmar for about a week, um, which was uh, the first time that I'd been involved in this kind of public deploy deployment of stuff, and we deployed them in a, a public area and people overran them. They came and played with them and looked at them and talked about them and all that. And so that was, um, that was quite a meaningful moment uh, for me in that. Um, the other piece I want to introduce is called the Double Deck Desk. This was done a couple of years later, a year or so, a couple of years later. I had started working, I was working with Heather Martin still, but I'd started working with Andy Bauscher, who is a product designer who's, in a way, he's been my partner um, ever since. Uh, he's kind of the, um, at this point he's basically the co-leader of the studio with me, and this is one of the early works we did together that I think we're both slightly embarrassed about, but I still like to talk about. Um, so this is a mad idea for a double deck desk, which uh, was we were tasked by our Hewlett Packard people to think about the workplace of the future, and built a desk that was had two levels, and the idea is that you could climb up to this upper level and engage in sort of high-level reflective work with the aid of some software that I built, actually, that um, tried to pull out themes from the day-to-day -day work you were doing to allow you to think about stuff in a higher level. 
And I am a guitar speaker. And so anyway, we built this prototype of a desk um, and put it into the atrium of the Hewlett Packard uh, Research Building in Bristol and left it there for a week or so and allowed people to use it and asked them what they thought and got all kinds of stories back. And I'll go back to that in a second. And then the third piece I want to bring up here is a piece called the Key Table, which um, I, we did, I did with uh, Brendan Walker, Sarah Pennington, and Ed Steele Andy on a different project. And this is a, part of a series of pieces, but this one in particular um, was a little table meant to be sat inside the entrance of your home that had a surface mounted on load sensors, um, which measure weight. But in this case, we measured the transient response of the load sensor to stuff being dropped on the table. And the scenario was that it would measure the emotion of the person entering the house because when they came in, they might, you know, if they're in a good mood, they just kind of set stuff down on the table. But if they were in a slightly more angry mood, they might slap it down or throw it or whatever. And this would start to try to get at that, that mood, and it would indicate the mood by um, tilting the picture shown in the background. Um, to indicate how hard stuff had been thrown. So if you walked in your house and found it, the picture was quite tilted, you might go, uh-oh, somebody's not happy here, I better be careful. That was the story, and that's, and that's how we built it. So we deployed that in the first of what I think is a real deployment. We deployed that to a family in London and gave it to them for much longer than we'd ever done anything until all of a month, and asked them to live with it. And the whole thing went really crazy. It all, all went, it all went totally unexpectedly. So instead of you reading it in terms of emotions, they really um, focused on the picture of the dog shown in the in the in the frame, which we had picked kind of just accidentally and because it happened to be available. And the, the dog was such a strong presence for them that they named the table Terence and started dressing it up and putting all kinds of stuff on it and got really quite weird about the whole thing. Um, and. So, it, and so, um, we actually hired a documentary filmmaker to, to do a film of the table, and, uh, and he did it separately. That's a long story, but we started working with documentary filmmakers as a way of assessing our work, which is something we still do. And he came back after a couple of weeks of filming and said, oh, I don't know if you're going to like this. It's all like a slow motion train wreck. And indeed, the video is quite amusing, but I won't show it to you now. Anyway, so that was, that was a kind of another data point. I think that taught me a lot about um, design is research. It taught me a few lessons, these things together, that I, I want to kind of draw a little bit. So, um, the first is that, you know, what, from what I said before, we can say things to the designs we make. We can take di different points of views, we can address different topics and bring them up to each other. And we can say them in a number of different ways. So we can be, um, we can say things that are complex, situated, multi-layered, ambiguous, we can kind of contradict ourselves, we can create moral ambivalence and all that. But the really key thing that all these things told me is people will talk back to them. That we don't, we're not the only people in the room. And there's a few lessons from that. So, first of all, the way people talk back from designs tells us a lot about the designs themselves. Like, designs are not really finished until you know what people are going to do with them. But also it tells us a lot about the people, or it can be. So, for instance, in the Hewlett-Packard situation, the kind of stories we got back were things like, um, people said, oh my god, our, our cubicles are already crowded, and now they want to save my money by making us share cubicles by having double deck desks in the cubicles. Or other people, one guy, we came back from a lunch break and found somebody had put uh, an inflatable alien in the double deck desk, suggesting it looked like a spaceship. Or somebody wrote a story for us um, talking about how we saw the thing as being like a judge's seat, where somebody would sit up in the top desk and lean down and look judgmentally on the people below, um, which actually might be true. And another person who said he thought it was a great desk for children, that somebody... And so all these stories sort of proliferated about the desk that we had never imagined, never intended, and yet, you know, are reasonable responses. And so um, this kind of notion that multiple stories can proliferate around designs is um, quite interesting and is, is something we still work on. But the, the other thing I learned, which is really important, is we need to listen to both sides of the conversation. And, it, and so um, I told you about the deployment of the bench and stuff in the Belmemer. The truth is, I believe, that we didn't do a great job of actually figuring out what people were saying about the benches and image bank. So we hung out for a week, we saw people playing with them, we talked to people and they go, oh yes, very nice, it's good that somebody's paying attention. We really did not capture what they thought these things were or were about or might be about. So, and that to me was an immense waste. And, it, and um, all, that, all that goes 
Oh, all that goes to say is that since that time I've been really committed to, to the idea that when we build stuff we need to study empirically what people do with it. Um, and the other point is, uh, that slightly more subtle maybe, is that, that even though we say stuff with products and people will appropriate them, that's, that is a, a tricky business of balance. So we can't, just as we can't totally own the message, at the same time people won't say random things back to the things we design. So even in the K table they say it's Terence the table, but they don't, for instance, say, oh, it's a telephone to talk to my mother. Um, the, 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 the products we make do constrain things, and yet we don't want to constrain this too far. So if, for instance, in building the table, you could see almost any of these things that people mis misappropriate. You could interpret as misappropriation and iterate the designs to try to constrain the constrain what, how people appropriate them to the point that you get a successful design because people do what you predict. But if you do that, that limits the surprise of how, what people might be telling you if you keep things open. And so for me, that, all it means to say is that a lot of the kind of work we do is always a business of balancing a kind of constraint and a kind of openness. We're using our designs to raise topics and suggest things while leaving them open enough that people can come back with new, with covered offers, as it were, new ways of understanding what we're doing. And so that's, that, that's all, again, sort of I, the course that was set for our design. And now I'll pause and talk about another project um, where this, some of this stuff plays out. So this is called the Prayer Companion. It's a more recent piece that's um, from a few years ago. And um, basically, we had another project where uh, working with colleagues, both in the studio, but also um, uh, uh, Mark Glyde and Peter Wright, who were at the time at York University, we started a project, again, designing technologies for older people. Um, but in this case, we ended up working in part with a group of nuns uh, who lived in the north of England. And these, the nuns are poor clares. They're a, a, um, an order of Catholic nuns that uh, were originally founded by Claire of Assisi, close colleague of Francis of Assisi. And um, we started working with them because we could, because they, uh, of a kind of serendipitous encounter with them, but also because they, represent, they were all quite elderly, and they, we thought they represented kind of a way of being old that broke through stereotypes of older people that are often kind of um, run through these sorts of funding programs that try to help older people and, and um, get them connected to technology. Um, anyway, we started to get to know the poor clairs over time, slightly at a distance because most of our communications with them were in a situation shown on the upper left where they were it, there in their enclosure and we were outside talking to them, um, and also through photographs that we got from inside the monastery and learned something about their lives over about a year um, of occasional visits and background reading and discussions and so forth. And basically the poor clerks are a group of nuns who um, have taken vows of enclosure, so they live most of their lives in the monastery. They're a contemplative sect, so they spend uh, a lot of their work is surrounds prayer of various sorts. Um, and they've taken a vow of, of poverty as well, so they do a lot of they um, lead a re relatively simple life, although in a very beautiful monastery they grow their own food and they do their own cooking and cleaning and so forth um, with relatively little help at the time. Um, and uh, as, we grew, as we got to know them, we came into the project with no preconception at all about what we would build for them and, um, and actually spent quite a long time, which is something I'm sadly fairly used to, having no idea what we were going to do and feeling rather panicked until finally one of us uh, said, well, how do they know what to pray for? Because we knew that they had different forms of prayer that they pursued. They have a, um, uh, they follow the, the, um, they follow the cycle of prayer mandated by the Catholic Church. They also have their personal prayer lives, but they also um, engage in prayers of intercession, where they pray on behalf of other people or about events going on in the world, um, to try to bring those those people and events in the presence of God. So interceding on their behalf. And the question, the question then became, how do they know what, what, what events to ask for God's intercession, if that's the right way of putting it, with? And that um, became the key to the device that we built. So 
the prayer, the way back, the prayer companion is the final outcome of our long design process, but it's basically a tabletop device that's about yay high, and on the top it shows a stream of text, um, a kind of never-ending stream of text that's drawn from two sources, RSS feed shown on the left um, from various news sites, uh, from, from a, something like 35 news sites around the world to try to um, give a very broad view of how people are thinking about events and news at the time, so different kinds of cultural and political perspectives, and mixed with that are statements drawn from social networking sites shown on the, on the right, which um, we collect from a site called uh, We Feel Fine, which itself goes over sites and looks for um, over various uh, blogs and Twitter and so forth, looking for comments that people have included that um, include the words I and feel with the results shown on the right. And we mix those together originally in about a 50-50 mix, and the idea was to try to give a kind of snapshot, a kind of continual view of, of what the concerns of the world were at the time, from the very large to the very small. And it's all shown on that device. Um, we built the device we finished it, we were allowed into the closure to install it within the monastery, and um, to our great joy, the, uh, the um, initial reaction of the nuns was really positive, and they said that you know they really liked it aesthetically, it fit in with the monastery very well, it wasn't too obtrusive, which they had been worried about before. And, and very soon afterwards, we also discovered that it was actually um, playing, a, playing a part um, in their prayer life, and it continued to, and did so continuously um, throughout its, its uh, time in the monastery. And so, you know, that's the quote. It's, so, uh, over time, um, they told us, sort of the account settled that indeed it did play a part in their prayer life, it was very valuable to them, it wasn't a huge part, it wasn't that, you know, it's not like they centered their lives around the prayer companion, the mother superior ta talked about it as being like the salt on, on the table, that it, it would add a little something to their life without being the main event. Um, and that was great, that was really good, and in, in the end they lived with it for over three and a half years until they had to move monasteries and decided not to take it with them. Um, as a footnote, I went up to the monastery recent, their new monastery, to talk to them about why they hadn't taken it with them, because I'm just dying to know why, and the mother of us just refused to tell me. She, she made an excuse, she basically told me, well, you know, it's quite valuable, it wasn't really ours, it's yours, and we were afraid it might get hurt in the transit. Mm -hmm. Which, I would have believed, except for then when they returned it, that another one of the nuns had gone to the old monastery, monastery to pick it up and taken it back in a plastic bag on a public bus. So I was like, you're not that worried, are you? Um, so I don't know. I think they were done with it. Um, but anyway, I, a side effect, part of what happened early on in the deployment was that the nuns actually didn't like the I feel statements very much. They didn't know what to do with them. So this is a great quote. I feel 34, what are you supposed to do with that? You know? And they uh, and um, and so they they complained that they 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 complained that a lot of the I feel statements they they didn't understand how these things were supposed to be requests for prayer how they were to understand them, um, and that led to a, that led to a really pivotal meeting, which is this is a not this is a different meeting because unfortunately I didn't really capture the meeting where we had a long discussion of what the I feels were about, what we intended. Unusually for us, we talked about what we had intended by including them, and they told us a lot about their attitude towards the I feels and their attitude towards prayers of intercession in general. And that was extremely illuminating to us. So I learned a lot about prayer, their attitudes towards prayer through that meeting, and meanwhile, they learned a lot about how we had intended the system and what kind of information we were giving. So that both of us were changed over the course of that meeting. Um, and briefly, you know, one of the things we took, one of the things we talked about, I'm going to do this total injustice. The nuns are, I have vast respect for the nuns, so um, if I make them sound at all anything but wonderful people, that's me, not them. But basically, they told me a couple of things. That one is that a number of the I feel statements just seem self indulgent to them. So even statements that I thought might be prayer worthy, like I feel lonely, I feel, uh, you know, without friends and and in truth, they said, well, you know, buck up, get a life, you know, um, don't complain to us. And, <laughs> and that, that's one of those ones where I may be mistranslated just a bit. But that was kind of the attitude, you know. 
And the other side of it was that they were saying, well, we know that people are unhappy. We, God knows that people are unhappy. We understand that there's a lot of unhappiness in the world, and we don't, you know, it's kind of bloody need to be reminded of it all the time. Um, maybe I didn't, I think I learned better than I'm expressing here what they meant by those things. But anyway, that's what they told us. And meanwhile, they learned, um, they learned to, they learned to think about the I feels differently. So this quote sort of captures it that they, that they started to understand that the I feels were not really meant as requests for prayers, but were expressions of people who themselves didn't know how to pray, and, that, and for whom they might pray on their behalf. Um, so again, that was the meaning, it was quite pivotal, it was quite, quite a, an interesting moment in that project. And then the last thing I just thought I'd show is just a small string of dialogue around the prayer companion, because no matter how I tell the story, the truth is that the piece was, the piece resourced a really a kind of rich and fluid set of engagements on the part of the nuns with what it was showing. That it wasn't always about prayer, it wasn't always about rejecting I feels, it was about a nun, it, it engaged them in a, it kind of threw out their experience, all the way from you know being horrified by a man beating his wife to death to laughing at this um, at this quote of I feel pretty oh so pretty, I feel pretty and witty and you know it's kind of like relief. So it sort of it it became a part of their experience that, w that was really rich and all the very age. And that's all I'll say about that. The last, the other thing, now, do I, how much time do I have? Am I okay for now? No, you can keep going. I can keep going, you know that. Um, so I'll just keep going then. Anyway, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, methodology and design, um, picking up on the conversation metaphor a bit, and uh, I'll just sort of cruise through some of this stuff because I don't know how familiar you are with it, but one of the things that we've done in our studio quite a bit and pretty continuously is work with cultural probes, which is an approach to doing research uh, on, of people that with, for whom we might design that I first developed with Tony Dunn as part of the Presence Project that I talked about, but this is actually a version of the probes that I sort of consider the, the, the definitive one in my mind. It's a version that we did I did with um, my group who worked on some of the other work I showed about the key tables. One of the products um, in the uh, early 2000s, um, and this was a, a project that we did to look at people's um, lives, their lives in their homes. And the reason I say it's, it's the version I usually drag out to show the probes, because it was the second time I'd done the probes. The first time was that it was um, with the project with Tony, but this is the second time, and the fact it was the second time meant that we knew that probes could work, and we were a bit confident, and we knew we could take them on and experiment with them a bit more than we did in the first one. So, um, I just am really pleased with some of these things. So, the notion behind cultural probes is to go, is to try to find a design-oriented way of asking people about who they were, that, who they are, which avoids some of the um, some of the constraints of social of methods like questionnaires or um, pre-scripted interviews or even semi-structured interviews with methods that kind of end up being performative and creating the kinds of topics and issues and people for whom you're talking the uh, issues uh, of the people you're talking to and instead try to open up the process of gathering information to um, allow a lot of un unexpected stuff to reveal. Be revealed, and in, and also part of the point of the probes is to try to subvert some of the relationships of researcher to research participant, and to in a way um, um, uh, do away with some of the kind of authority or status or, or uh, understandings of what a researcher is about. So probes are collections of simple tasks that we give to people, often that that often take a kind of graphical nature, as shown here where we give people things and ask them to respond to them, and the responses are often quite, you know, revealing about who they are, what they care about, and so forth. So from this collection, the piece on the, on the top, um, second left, is a camera that we've repackaged with um, requests for various photos, things like show us a social event in your house, or the view from your kitchen window, or show us something red, or take a picture of something at 4 o'clock on a Tuesday. Um, or the spiritual center of your home. So all kinds of shots for pictures that you, where you reveal images that you wouldn't get if you simply gave somebody a camera and said, take a picture of your home. You get them pointing the camera in unexpected directions. Or we gave household rules shown in the center there, which were little tags. We asked people to write down the rules for their household, whether implicit or explicit. Um, 
We gave a bathroom pad on the far left in the center. We had a little hook for hanging up near the toilet so that you could look at it at certain moments of the day, and it included little tiny little news articles that were kind of those little quirky side pieces and asked people to write comments about them. Um, or the dream recorder is a, a, a little um, uh, audio recorder which we repackaged with instructions that when you woke up from a vivid dream, you pull the tab and the little light would go on, you had 10 seconds to tell us about the dream and then it shut off. Um, and there's more, you know, there's as many as you see there. And the point about these things is, and we gave those to families around London, 20 families I believe, and collected huge amounts of stuff back. And then the kinds of materials we get back are um, quite, quite rich, quite difficult to interpret sometimes, um, sometimes um, fascinating, sometimes a bit boring, um, but they build up a texture of the people for whom we're working that it turns out to be quite useful and quite compelling. Um, so there's any number of photographs, any number of little statements about the home, statements about what people care about and believe, and the way we work with these usually is just to allow them to serve as background textures uh, of, about the people and families that were we design for, but also sometimes things will come out and be particularly highlighted as, as somehow serve as landmarks for us that are quite significant in our design, pro in our design process, and that happened here too. Um, anyway, I don't have time to go into much more depth if you must ask me. Uh, the, other, the other thing we often use in our um, process, which I alluded to earlier, is design workbooks. So the, in a way, the alternative stuff I showed was all the design workbook. We did a workbook for the nuns. And this is something we do often. So that after having, when we start designing, we start amassing um, large numbers of proposals and ideas. And there comes a point when we start to capture those in, when we often capture those in a workbook. And that becomes a punctuation point for the um, project. And the point about the proposals, they're not just sketches, it's not like having a sketchbook, there are things that we have processed to the point that they um, are a bit more developed than proposals and a bit more for public consumption. So they're certainly meant for sharing within the team and sometimes, but by no means always, we show them with the participants in the project to see what they make of emerging ideas. Um, and so those are some examples, and like, eh, I could talk about them forever. Um, at some point, usually we work from the proposals to develop, uh, to find a proposal for the system we would like to build and then start actually designing what that system will be and how it will work. And um, that, of course, brings us into, into the workshop um, where we work with any number of sketches, uh, uh, renders, models, um, test prints. So these days we work with uh, 3D printers a lot and we'll go through any number of sort of 3D printed models of systems, um, software tests, electronic tests, and so forth. And that all becomes one big, as Sean would put it, the conversation with materials as the, the final design slowly emerges. I should say that I tend not to focus on that as being part of our as being a part of our research, but recently a number of people in my studio, in particular Andy Boucher, um, David Cameron, and Nadine Jarvis have started publishing papers trying to get at how the making itself becomes, leads to new knowledge. So I point you to their work. And as I said, we often, um, we almost always deploy the stuff we do with people to try for periods at least a month and up to years. Um, so the prayer campaign is the longest. And what I want to suggest is all these methods are kind of of a piece with actually our design deployments and our designs, in that they set up a kind of dialogue between that works between us and our participants um, that occurs over time. So it, there's a sense in which when we make the probes, that becomes a statement in a conversation. When the people respond to and add to the probes and, and um, give them back to us, that's their way of making the next conversational turn. And then we come back and reply to them in the form, of not always, but reply to their responses, their probe responses in the form of a bunch of proposals, their replies come back to us and shape the way we actually make whatever it is we're going to make until finally we hand them a product and that becomes, you know, again, our turn in the conversation and the way they use that, that research product and talk about it and tell us about it becomes kind of their turn in the conversation. So the whole thing is like a to and fro dialectic approach uh, in which we, we kind of take turns in talking to each other. 
Um, and of course, that also happens within the studio as we talk through these objects, and the, the people we work with, with are often talking amongst themselves at each stage about what they expect and what they might see, and whether things are panning out the way they want. And it, there's just a few points about that process that I think are, are worth talking about. So first of all, it is by no means a scientific process, and it's pretty self-evident. And I have written about that here and there, but I need not belabor it here. It's not a scientific process. It's much more a process of, um, of interpretation that forms over time and, and in, in collaboration with our participants. Um, but the other thing that's interesting is that as a conversation, it's by no means arbitrary, or it's not based on fantasy. It's not uh, a totally uh, subjective thing, and it's not even a subjective thing within our studio. But it's one that's grounded in the, in the materials that we make and grounded all the way along in the specifics of the probes that we make and in in the ways that they answer the probes in the kind of reality of the proposals that we suggest and certainly in the, in the actual products that we make and the, and the way people actually use them as opposed to maybe talk about how they use them. All the way along this, product, this process of interpretation and trying to read into things is empirically grounded in those ways in a way that I find um, quite important and also quite interesting and slightly intriguing. And so I want to show you um, one more project and, and then um, done, basically. So this is a more recent work. This is um, sort of our last published work. It's a, a selection of pieces called Indoor Weather Stations, and um, in which we built three devices to try to uh, um, enliven the, the uh, microclimate of the home, the kind of trying to br draw attention to the way the home itself has a kind of um, it is a kind of ecology with you know air currents and different light patterns and tropics and um, and uh, Arctic regions and so forth. We did this in a project. Well, actually, I'll tell you slightly more about what they're about. So there's three designs here. One, one is called the temperature tape, and it's a reel with two 2.5 meter long ribbon cables that end in a hook and an eye on one side and an eye on the other with heat sensors on either end and a dial that shows the difference in heat between the two sides. And we did that to try to help people understand temperature gradients with the, in the um, home. The um, piece in the middle is called the light collector and it's got a copper beefed um, sort of bowl with a light sensor in the middle that picks up the color of the ambient light surrounding it, not what it's pointing at, but just the total sum of the light, um, the color of the light um, near the device, and then shows it on, his, on a display on front that builds it up line by line every five minutes, so you get a kind of straight view of the change of light color over time in the home over about two hours. Does that make sense? Okay. And then the piece on the right is called the wind tunnel, and it's a little device that has uh, in the chimney, it has a gust sensor that can pick up very minute um, breezes in the home, and then it amplifies those using the fan in the kind of chamber to blow around a, a series of a set of laser. You can't see it very well, but a set of laser-cut sort of trees within the chamber to make sort of storms out of tiny breezes um, as a way of uh, drawing attention to air currents in the home. Now we we built all these things. Um, in a project which had several purposes, but one of them was to try to look at how we think about um, how we can uh, talk about the environment and environmental issues uh, using technology in a way that isn't didactic or, or using um, persuasive computing or nudge or whatever. So most of it, certainly at the time, most of the work in environmental HCI, as it's known, was all around, all around measuring um, the consumption of of resources like electricity and so forth and basically telling people to use less which is an approach that we have problems with on many levels so we were trying to we were trying to find a, a different approach to this one that was more playful and more open to interpretation and and the idea was to build these things to build up again to kind of highlight the microclimate of the home both as sort of a rhyme as it were for the um, the, the global climactic conditions and also as a way to try to help people appreciate the artificial environments we make in the home and think about um, them both aesthetically and in terms of energy consumption. We batch produced 22 um, sets of each of the designs, that, which is 
I think the first one um, that we moved into not just making one or two of the things that we've um, designed, but actually batch producing them on mass so that we could do larger scale field trials, which is a way to uh, uh, kind of an approach that we've been working with over the last five years or so. And we distributed them to um, uh, 22 households within the uh, London area. Um, and uh, what do I want to say? No, not so much about that. So um, the idea is that the idea is to actually try to get at more stories and more ran a larger range of experience around how people use our devices, and also in a way to try to experiment with whether um, communities of practice can form around using these experimental devices we're creating. This is work in progress, and I'm not going to say too much, but it, let's put it this way, working with batch production this way turns out to be incredibly challenging all the way through, and not least in the, in the kind of collecting stories and data collection and, and, got, and working with the data. So I'm not going to do too much with that here, I'll just tell you a little bit about what happened in this deployment. So the first thing we found is that we, put, we packaged up all these devices and took them off to people's homes. Um, we distributed a few in our studio and also some in a cafe, but um, but uh, I'll just talk about people. when we deployed them in people's homes, we'd go in, they'd offer us a cup of tea, we'd sit down, we'd have this mysterious box that was closed up, and sort of set the scene of talking about how we'd been designing this for a while, we'd already done pro study with these people and so forth, and finally unveiled the pieces and brought them out onto their table or whatever, and usually the reaction was, ooh, that's great, you know, that's really nice, they're really amazing looking. Um, and, you know, as the quote here says, they're really intrigued about the possibilities of the device. We, um, as people lived with the devices, and this was a deployment that was done over time, so some people lived with them for well more than a year, and other people with for at least three months. Um, they tried them out using them in various ways, and, and we found that, in a way, a lot of people either tried to use them for very utilitarian purposes, and then later, and then other times for play. So, for instance, they tried to use the, um, Wind, the, the wind tunnel to look at drafts in their home and try to figure out where they might be losing heat through drafts, and that didn't work so well, it kind of worked. But they used the temperature tape measure to, again, look at whether they needed insulation in various places, or to look at changes, if they'd made changes in their home, and it kind of worked and kind of didn't. And they sort of discovered over time that these things are not utilitarian tools for um, conserving energy. They also used them to put for play to a degree, so they um, you know, they, there's a quote here, they try to blow down the trees in the wind tunnel so you could get the fan going really quick. Or they, there was another people who told us about a game where they would see who could heat up their side of the temperature tape faster, you know, including putting it under the sleeping cat or whatever. Um, and so there were various ways to play with the devices, and that was kind of okay for a while. But to be honest, a lot of people over time... become sort of pieces of the furniture and um, we don't really pay attention to them much anymore. And, and I think that was real. I don't want to downplay that. That was, that was uh, I'll ask you later why you're laughing quite that hysterically. Um, the rabbits. <laughs> you guys read too fast. Um, but so we were getting really, I was getting quite depressed, um, but it turned out that actually in discussing with people later about the about um, the devices, things started coming out that were more intriguing than just simply, oh, they're boring, I don't want them. So I've got a couple of key quotes here. One is that we had a number of people talk about the kind of presence that the pieces had in their home. And one of the things that became, one of the things that seemed to be a recurring theme for people is that when they first got the devices, they would move them around quite a bit in their homes, experimenting with them in different places. And then after a while they'd settle down, they'd find a home for the pieces. And I think we, that sort of certainly is recognizable to me, that you, you find where something like this belongs and then it belongs there. So one guy talked about the, I uh, well, remember, the, you know, the wind tunnel he put near his bed because that was where there were occasional drafts as people moved around. And the light detector was near a plant because it caught just the right light from the window and sort of echoed the plant and living on light and so forth. So, the, the pieces took on this kind of personality for pieces, for people, where it turned out even though they didn't think they were incredibly valuable to them, they still had a kind of fondness for them as being an entity in their home. And at the end of the project, we gave people the choice of whether to keep them or not, and a substantial number of people actually did want to keep the devices because they liked them. 
So that was cool. Um, more intriguing was the number of uh, the, the number of conversations that we had were more like the bottom court, where in fact people said, "Well, no, I don't look at it that much, but it is really intriguing to see the light levels change over time and change over the course of the year, so you can sort of see from the light detected that in the summer the palette of lights is quite different than in the winter. We also um, had made a website where people could get the readings of different um, of these devices they could compare with other people in the project and um, you know people were really intrigued that the palette of color in their home would be very um, strikingly different than those in other homes um, and that would make them reflect on the fact that they liked that. And we also had people indeed talking about the way that um, they became aware of the, the, these things made them aware of the, the kind of flows of, of the climate going outside and inside their home, and the way they kind of moved in, in, into their home as well as being changed by their homes. So, um, all of this, I mean, this is, all of this has made me, this is sort of one of a series of projects where it's made me realize that, the, that part of the value of our designs is, I mean, to, is not just to whether they, um, I mean, it's made me question where the value in our designs are. It's made me understand, at least for myself, that part of the de part of the desirable thing from the designs we make is to make stuff that people like and they want to use and all that. But we're not actually commercial product designers; we're researchers, and there's actually quite a lot of value not in the not in the, the long-lasting, you know, sort of I want to buy that thing, but actually in the conversations that they provoke and the ways that they help us understand the topics that the designs are treating as well as, well, it, so it's about more than just the designs. And that's a position that I'm moving towards that hopefully we'll hear more about later. And that's really about all I've got to say. That's an overview of the work, showing some of the work, and I hope that you will like it. And the other thing I did was just point out that the, a lot of the stuff, if you, did, if you are intrigued, the, the, pretty much everything I've talked about here has um, been published, which may be boring, and so I've just saved you a lot of reading time, if nothing else. Okay? <laughs> And that's it. Thanks.